Because I think Bishop Strickland is being invited to a holiness that you and I will never understand. You know, he's experiencing a cross of rejection, which by the way, Jesus himself experienced. Again, I don't know all of the backstory. I just know that every challenge is an invitation to go more deeply into what it means to be more humble. Welcome back to the Father Leo Show, where we're dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. And there's been a lot of commentary in regards to the news of Bishop Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler in Texas. And the fact is, we all know that he was relieved from his position as the Bishop of Tyler, Texas. This comes from Cardinal DiNardo in an interview. It says, as a result of the visitation, the statement continues, the recommendation was made to the Holy Father that the continuation in office of Bishop Strickland was not feasible, which is an interesting term. After months of careful consideration by the dicastery for bishops and the Holy Father, the decision was reached that the resignation of Bishop Strickland should be requested. Having been presented with that request on November the 9th, 2023, Bishop Strickland declined to resign from his office. Pope Francis then decided to remove the bishop. And so pending more permanent arrangements for the Diocese of Tyler, Cardinal DiNardo said that the Holy Father has at the same time appointed Bishop Joe Vasquez, the Bishop of Austin, as the Apostolic Administrator for the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. This is kind of unique church news, and I know a lot of people get involved because the saga or perhaps the drama about the bishop has been kind of in the front page of even secular papers, simply because, according to many reports, Bishop Strickland was a critic of the Holy Father's, you know, certain phrases, teachings, not necessarily teachings of the Catholic Church, because again, the Holy Father has never taught anything contrary to the Catholic faith, but there has been obviously a lot of people, generally people who are more progressive, they would call themselves that, kind of champion Holy Father as a voice of change. And so they honestly think that the Holy Father is going to change the church's teachings. And as such, uh, Bishop Strickland would kind of make comments about that on his social media. He's also been a very staunch critic uh, of the Biden administration, as well as things that he's seeing in modern day politics, which is kind of promoting a lot of confusion. So in a way, how do you feel about that? People will ask me, Father Leo, what do you think about Bishop Strickland? Well, I will say that I do know Bishop Strickland. I have uh, worked with him even in his diocese. We've met on a few occasions. And, and while we are certainly, um, you know, more along the same lines with how we need to promote the faith because he's a very loving and holy bishop, uh, there are probably going to be some differences that I have with how he promotes it. But that doesn't mean that I would want to have him silenced because I've firmly believe that that voices of criticism is actually not a bad thing. Uh, however, in a an exclusive interview with uh, LifeSite News on November the 11th, uh, it was conducted shortly after the Vatican made the announcement and relieved him of his pastoral governance as to why he was why he thinks he was asked to be removed. He actually says this, and you know what? Let me actually play that clip for you because I find it incredibly powerful. And these are coming from him in his own words. Forces in the church right now uh, don't want the truth of the gospel. They want it changed. They want it ignored. They want to be rid of the truth that is gloriously not going to go away, the truth that is Jesus Christ, his mystical body, which is the church, all the wonders that the martyrs died for and the saints lived for through almost 2,000 years since Christ died and rose. So 
And, and again, um, certainly Pope Francis has the responsibility of making the supreme pontiff decisions. He has, he's the only one with that authority. But there are many forces working at him and influencing him to, to make these kinds of decisions. So I know it becomes frustrating, um, but we, that's why we pray for the Pope, for him as a son of God and for his role as the Supreme Pontiff. Okay, praying for his role as the Supreme Pontiff. So you heard it directly from him. You know, when he was asked originally how he felt about that, he obviously admitted that there was obviously some, some pain that he had and, and even maybe some questions. But at the same time, this conversation about Bishop Strickland and his vocal, you know, vocal critique uh, against things that are being said or things that seem to be purportedly, you know, promoted, you know, are bishops allowed to have an opinion? Yes, they sure are. As a matter of fact, every year the bishops gather in the Archdiocese of Baltimore for almost a week and they discuss a lot of these things. And I, I can say for sure that they don't all agree with each other. There is kind of, you know, some even so, some real discussion. I don't want to say a vehement discussion, but I know that there are strong opinions. Is the church divided? Yeah, on a lot of things. Thankfully, thankfully, in this conversation that we're having now, we're going to try to approach this and how we are supposed to react and also to acknowledge how we feel. Because I know that in our shows, I can just give you this information. You can find all of this online for sure. But no one is actually really analyzing what is a proper reaction on the part of Catholics, but also not necessarily acknowledging how we feel. And so first and foremost, let's just talk about an immediate reaction. What would be the proper response of a Catholic? Number one, relax. Don't start picking sides. Don't be the person who gets so easily overwhelmed and convicted by the latest news that they start putting, I don't know, in their profile, a flag or saying, I stand with. Because if that's the case, we're just kind of giving in to this urge for salaciousness. And what we need to do is be a little bit more people of equanimity, people of balance. We've got to remember that, that the ship is, is the image of the church. And there are going to be times when even if you're holding on to the rudder very strongly, you might start to, I don't know, take waves. You might be pushed to the left and pushed to the right. But people of equanimity are, are people who can keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. And I love this about G.K. G. K. Chesterton. He's that great philosopher and scholar and, and theologian. He talks about in his book, Orthodoxy, that the church is going to experience stuff like this all the time. We are going to be pulled to the left and to the right. What our job is, is to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Because even if the waves overwhelm, and you can ask St. Peter this as he was walking on water, if you start paying attention to all that stuff, you are going to sink. And yes, the church will seemingly start to sink. But if you keep your eyes fixed on Christ, Chesterton tells us, grace turns that sinking ship into a submarine. And we keep heading for Christ. And ultimately, we know that it is Jesus. It is Jesus Christ who is in charge of the church. We can look, for example, at Luke 22, verse 32, where it talks about how he prays for Simon Peter, who is the vicar of Jesus, the Pope, the Holy Roman Pontiff, the bridge builder for people on the left and to the right. And he says, I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back to him, because even Peter denied Jesus three times, God's grace will work through Peter and strengthen the other disciples. You see, how are we supposed to react? Well, don't. Let's respond. Let's have a little bit more responsibility. Let's think through this a little bit more. Because in reality, we know that the church will continue to survive. 
and we can't be in a sense part of a uh, of team such and such you know saint paul talks about that that you know early in the church there was always conversation you know well i'm an apostle of james and i'm an apostle of peter and and i am got to be an apostle of paul and paul says no no no, 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 no. You're disciples, you're students, and yes, you're going to have certain teachers who are going to influence you greatly, but come on. Ultimately, God is your God. Jesus Christ is your Lord. Let that be first and foremost, and you're going to see that our reactions don't have to be as visceral and as strong. But now again, we're going to talk about feelings in just a second. I'm talking about reactions. It's not wise for us to react simply because we saw this on the news. And I think that's what the news wants. Media loves controversy. So what is our response? Pray. I know that sounds corny. I know that totally sounds corny, but it is the ultimate answer. Turn off the radio, turn off the phones, unless you're watching my show, of course. And, and more importantly, turn to the Lord in prayer. Because only then can you kind of have a little peace of mind and realize that, yes, there might be injustices, especially knowing that there seems to be, there seems to be a movement to silence opposing voices or to, as we would say, um, mitigate the reach of people who might be understood or viewed as conservative, more traditional, in favor of the algorithms pushing the news, which is more progressive, liberal. You know, how are we supposed to react to that? You don't. You have to be thoughtful in your response. But we also have to admit something, that the church, although divided, we in the pews, we just don't know enough. Even me as a priest, I don't know enough about what the two visiting bishops did when they, they kind of basically did an aug, uh, audit. Uh, they, they were visitators sent by the Holy Father to kind of learn about this brewing controversy that they'd experienced. So uh, obviously there were people who wrote to the Vatican, wrote to the Metropolitan Bishop who was Cardinal DiNardo, and just basically complained. This happens quite a bit. It is very frustrating that sometimes the complaints are oftentimes seen as um, truth. And yeah, it, it's frustrating when we can't face our accusers or when we have to prove our innocence rather than, you know, um, there was that phrase that we used to have in law. Remember when laws were actually followed? You know, we are innocent until proven guilty. And so... Hopefully, the process was such that his innocence was presumed. We have no idea, and I don't think we ever will. But if you have that great of a desire, then you have to ask yourself, am I just being nosy? Am I just trying to be a know-it-all? Or you're going to say, no, I just need to know so I can make a good, informed decision on how to react. And I'm telling you how to react. Don't overreact. In reality, the church will survive really will. And we cannot take sides. The only side we have to take is to be in union with the Holy Father. And Pope Francis is currently our Holy Father. If there's anyone you have to stand with, it's him. And thankfully, Bishop Tyler, in his authentic spiritual humility, agrees with me. You know, he even says, let's just pray for our Holy Father. No, you know, he doesn't know what's going to happen next as a bishop for himself. His faculties were not removed. He might have been placed on a censure, which basically means he's he's being, in a sense, censored. He, he can't speak to the people of Tyler, Texas as their bishop, but he is still a priest. He is still a bishop. So now let's address our feelings, because I think this is probably where we're going to be a little bit more helpful. Let's admit it is very understandable that our reactions are going to be, if you supported Bishop Strickland, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be hurt. But we also have to know that telling the truth is always going to wind up not benefiting you. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. But here's how our feelings can be informed. 
Stuff like this has happened in the church before. I don't know if you realize this, but St. Paul and St. Peter, they had their debates. They had their own discussions. They had their own, in a sense, disagreements, although they agreed, obviously, on the deposit of faith. We take a look at, I don't know, St. Joan of Arc. She was actually condemned. She was martyred by the church. The church killed her and eventually proclaimed her a martyr. And then I look to Bishop Tyler's patron, St. John Vianney. He's the patron of all priests. He's the one who came into his diocese of Ars in France, which was a know-nothing town. He served the people there well. He was in confession, helping to forgive sins. He was certainly not a pushover. He was very strong and adamant in teaching the faith and criticizing culture, which I know Bishop Strickland did. He criticized our, our pathetic culture, not because he wanted to be, make people feel bad, but to in the same way a doctor has to criticize a lifestyle if it's killing his patient. And that's what he did. And St. John Vianney was even accused of being a pious fraud. They actually sent a petition to everyone in his church, in his diocese of ours, and sent it to the bishop to try to oust this holy priest, John Vianney. And to the bishop's surprise, John Vianney even signed that same petition because his humility helped model his feelings, helped him to understand that, yeah, you might feel this way, but the reaction has to be more Catholic than just simply human. I don't, I don't think Bishop Strickland is gonna advocate for people to have marches, you know, in, in Vatican City, you know, like with protest signs, because I think Bishop Strickland is being invited to a holiness that you and I will never understand. You know, he's experiencing a cross of rejection, which by the way, Jesus himself experienced. Again, I don't know all of the backstory. I just know that every challenge is an invitation to go more deeply into what it means to be more humble. In fact, we know that there have been a lot of priests who have been silenced, even martyred, because they spoke out against an establishment. And yes, some of the establishment is being controlled by forces of evil. Even your own dear Father Leo was, in a sense, <laughs> challenged to consider how I am not afraid to call out the silliness in the church. But we also know that feelings, they become people's facts. And what we have to do is be as cunning as serpents, but as innocent as doves when we start to call out the established, institutionalized sinfulness in our world. And I just know that the feelings that we are going to have might be upset, hurt, you know, frustration. Some on the other side might be rejoicing. Yay, another one has silenced. Well, that's on them. But, but again, Bishop Tyler is being invited to a, a humility and to a level of holiness that you and I will never know. It's the same holiness that King David experienced in what I call the Shimei effect. You see, King David was very popular. He could get anything he wanted. In fact, that's what he did when he killed Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, who he slept with because he was so enamored by her beauty. And he had Uriah come to his palace, try to get him drunk, and then put him on the battlefield so that he would be killed, especially knowing that Bathsheba was pregnant with King David's illegitimate child. I say illegitimate, but you know what I mean. Now, obviously, Bishop Strickland didn't do any of that stuff, but he had his critics and they seemed to silence him. And thankfully, Bishop Strickland is humble enough that he didn't try to silence his critics, even if he himself was silenced. But Shimei was just a poor man from a village that was watching King David walk by. And Shimei was throwing stones at King David and saying, you're a scoundrel, you're a rapist, you're, a, you're an evil man. 
And King David's forces said, hey, King David, do you want me to just walk over there and lop off his head? Do you want me to kill him? And King David said, no, don't. Because maybe this man Shimei was sent by God to humble him. This is, like I said, an opportunity for every one of us, but especially Bishop Strickland, to experience the grace to know that we don't know the whole truth, but if we can keep our eyes fixed on Christ and not pay attention to all the craziness around us from the left and to the right, and yes, keeping in mind that we have to pray for the conversion of everyone in leadership position, including the Pope and his middle management, because they need prayers too. Sure, they also might need some criticism, but if it comes from you, make sure it is coming from a mindset and a heart filled with prayer. So, however you feel and however you react, first, let's make sure we talk to God about it because he's the only one who knows the truth. And thankfully, he is the one who is keeping our Catholic faith afloat on a very turbulent sea as we pilgrimage to our destination in heaven. I hope that this provides some perspective. If this was helpful to you, please share this video with others. Make sure you also tell others to subscribe and help us out with the subscribing because it helps to promote our videos out to others and hopefully even um, gets on the right algorithm, so to speak. And then also, if you are willing to support us in our Patreon community, it's the only way that we can keep dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on The Father Leo Show. And between now and then, stay hungry for God.